All right, welcome everyone uh, to CCCOER's final webinar of the 2021 academic year. And uh, we're really excited about this one, um, Models for Transforming Classrooms to be Equitable and Anti-Racist. And of course, using um, open educational resources and open pedagogy. And we have some wonderful speakers with us today uh, to tell us about the work that they're doing at uh, their colleges and within their systems. Um, next slide, please. So uh, we're gonna do introductions of our speakers uh, and a quick overview in just a minute. But just to let you know, um, up front, we have three project teams who are speaking with us today. One is um, an environmental science uh, course um, with the support of the library at Roxbury Community College, uh, just outside of Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, the second project team is a biology course transformation um, that was done under the Oregon Equity and Open Education Program. And uh, our third um, team is um, an introduction to business uh, class that was transformed through the Open for Anti-Racism program, which is out of California. And then at the end, we'll tell you a little bit about some summer activities that are available since this is our last webinar of the academic year. Next slide, please. All right, now it is my pleasure to introduce our speakers and let them say hello to you. And I'm gonna start with uh, Deborah Crumpton, who is a professor of business and business technology at Sacramento City College in California. Good afternoon, everybody. Glad to be here. Thank you, Deborah. And, and next up is um, Dr. Jalal Gayam Gami, <laughs> who is- Bravo, an bravo. <laughs> Thank you for correcting me, Jalal. He's environmental science a professor there at Roxbury Community College, and he also do, uh, is instructional technology. Welcome, everyone. Good to be here. Thank you, Jalal. And next up, we have Michelle Huss, who is a biology faculty at Portland Community College. Hi, thank you for having me. Thanks, Michelle. And um, next up is Jen Claudini. She's faculty librarian at the Portland Community College, and she is the project lead for the Equity and Open Education program in Oregon. Hello, everybody. I'm glad to be here. Thanks, Jen. And uh, next up is Joy Shoemate, uh, who is the director of online learning at College of the Canyons. She's also the course facilitator and developer for the Open for Anti-Racism course. Hi, everyone. Pleasure to be with you all today. Thank you, Joy. And I also wanted to introduce my colleague, um, Ted Intarabumrung, who is the coordinator of library services at Roxbury Community College. He's also my co-moderator today. OK, good afternoon, everyone else. Good. Have I'm enjoyed to participate in these sessions. Yeah, and Ted is also on our executive council as part of our professional development committee. So wonderful. Um, next slide, please, Liz. All right, for those of you who are new to CCCOER, there might be some of you out there. <laughs> We've been doing this work since 2007. So we work with community colleges to expand awareness and access to high quality OER. And we do uh, a lot of professional development, which is what these webinars an opportunity to hear from your peers and from other experts in the field. Um, we also work on OER leadership programs. And at the heart of this is um, improving student equity and success. Next slide, please. And here's our members. <laughs> and so we're excited to have members in um, 34 US states and in one Canadian state up, up in Alberta. Um, although we also work with um, college systems throughout Canada um, through our Open Education Global um, parent organization. Next slide, please. All right, we are, we are just about to get to these amazing speakers, but I just wanted to talk to you a little bit about, um, we're talking about transforming our courses uh, to be equitable and anti-racist uh, through the use of open educational practices. And for those of you um, who might be a little bit new to some of this, um, there's a lot of acronyms and um, you know kind of uh, terms that you will hear, and each of our speakers will speak you know uniquely to what they do. But it's really about using open educational resources to lower barriers, um, using what we call open pedagogy, and and I know that people will kind of um, 
you know, uh, unpack that a little bit. It's really about student-centered teaching. You'll hear expressions like renewable assignments and what, what does that mean in as an open educational practice? Um, students coming in as co-creators of knowledge um, in the classroom and really about active contextual and con collaborative learning. So those are kind of the broad parameters and you're gonna hear some wonderful examples today of um, faculty who are doing that work with the support of their libraries their and their um, systems um, programs. So uh, next slide. And now we are gonna turn this over to Ted and Jalal to tell us about the work at Roxbury Community College. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Ted again. I'm a librarian at uh, Roxbury Community College. Uh, today, I want to share experiences uh, open educational practices with my colleague, Jalal, uh, who is a professor of environmental science and, and very in, kind of exciting to share our unique collaboration between librarian and faculty members who use open educations to support our student and reduce uh, equity, I mean, to, ex to improve our equity and reduce uh, anti-lism in like a small college in Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. I think all of you might recognize our Roxbury Community College with Establish our RCC or Kuti College since in 1974. 1974, majority of our students is diverse. We have students by average age around uh, 32 years old, and then they came from different uh, ethnic groups. Okay, and then we majority is the female, the genders, and 30 percent male, and most of them come like African-American around 55%, and then Hispanic around 7%, and Cape Verdean 3%, and Asian 2%, and, and students who have more than two races, about 2%. And then our students come from uh, more than 30 countries with different origins and in linguistic diversities. Mm -hmm. And most of our students very poor by average. And then they didn't, hardly to get support from their family. So it means that 79% of RCC students have uh, uh, e EFC of zeros. Okay, they had to depend on the Pell Grants. Pell Grants 75%. And then the average Pell, Pell Grant award about $3,000. Mm -hmm. And then RCC student does not participate in any federal student on the loan program. And then however, our student, our college is kind of affordable. Mm -hmm. So, and then OER is very important for us to reduce the cost of the textbooks. And then our uh, team, we, we formed a team they call OER Tax Force to kind of put this kind of project up for, to reduce our student to ex improve our student I mean, equity and reduce entitlement. And then librarian and I mean, the, the professional staff and faculty member here try to uh, create like an OER platform for our student and create the lib guide to for access and train, provide the training. And at the same time to I mean, motivate our faculty member to use OER people wide uh, stipends our stakeholders support about OER. And in the same time, we try to generate like a nurturing and then kind of peer 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 to peer help assistant be created the OER ambassadors. We selected the faculty member like a hero in OER to come in and then try and from each department like a STEM or humanities or liberal arts to encourage consult, I mean kind of consult person for, for new OER, I mean, person. And at the same time, as a librarian or library staff, we provide kind of platform 
to do like a correct information, gathering information, and then, for example, now we in I mean pandemic generates like an opportunity for us. I mean, and then we create like a RCC COVID nineteen history projects. In the same time, we have like a last year we have like a Black Life Matter. We collect the Black men speak voices in Massachusetts and then keep it in our archive. Mm -hmm. And this is a project for us. If you're interested, you just use your iPhone and scan our QR code. You're going to see our project in more details. Mm -hmm. And the same thing like a Black men speak. Yeah, we, our, we have the archive platform to collect the, the like a video or picture of Black men speak. And at the same time, we have the COVID-19 history project. We interview or uh, in, in, in encourage our student or faculty member and staff to share their experiences about COVID experience. Mm -hmm. We keep that. Mm -hmm. And this is kind of project for us. Mm -hmm. And now we have OE, OER or open, uh, open education. And next step, we're gonna do like an open pedagogy. We're gonna engage our students to participate uh, their learning materials and then they like a support their interest and use material appropriate for their level and their interest. And then uh, I use, I got, I mean, get the idea from Rajiv and Robinson about the components of uh, open pedagogy, such as like a communities, learner, different education, access, and public context. And now I'm going to ask Jara to share his uh, open education or open pedagogy with you. So good afternoon, everyone. I uh, try to be informal in presentations to bring you to the conversation. So um, feel free to put your questions into the chat. I am not going to ignore them, but I'm going to answer them at the end. Um, I would like to change one word because of our uh, population that I teach are mostly elderly. A word has to change. And what is that word that ha we have to change in our, you, in our conversation today? Does anybody have any idea what word has to change since the, since we are not teaching children, we are teaching adult? So peda means, peda means children. Gauji means directing. I am not directing any children. <laughs> I am teaching all adult. So this is andragogy and it's not open pedagogy. So, I just wanted to make that distinction because when I am teaching my population, my students, I am not directing them in their life. They are in my class because they want to learn something useful so they can use it for their future. So it's already very much defined environment. What I am going to do today, I'm going to talk to you about four major items and one of them we are going to divide it to two sections. First, I'm going to talk how it is, uh, how it is my luck to have somebody like Ted in our, in our school to help me to teach better. That's uh, library and you. Basically, that's to create, to create friendship with your librarian is the best thing you can do in any college. Put the politics aside, meet the person eye to eye and tell them you need them. And I have done that and I have benefited from it. The second item that I will go to is the course design. I don't design my course to, to teach people. I design my course to learn together. So keep that in mind. I am learning from my students as I am going along. They are learning from me as we are going along. So that brings some kind of excitement. Now they are trying to teach me instead of I teaching them. And they are not down there. I'm not talking from the higher position down to them. We are talking face to face, eye to eye, at the same level, whatever you, word you want to use. I, I don't mind whichever the vocabulary you want to use. I stay together with my students as a team. 
we try to do research in environmental sciences and we try to make a teammates, our students are teammates instead of members of a class. Next slide, please. Ted, next slide. So this is library website. In the library website, we have a very uh, rich in, uh, set of information, something under research help. Under research help, you will find research guide. To have a research guide, next slide, please. To have a next research uh, guide, you have to create a partnership. You have to give your course to a librarian and let your librarian guide you what you need. I can't have Ted to teach everything in my course. I am going to have him to help me with something called term paper. So term paper is, is a assignment we are doing. I go to Ted a few months ahead of time, tell him what I want to do, what I want my students to learn, and give him a topic. We have changed this topic a few times. Last thing we did was using algae, which is an environmental, uh, environmental uh, topic, using algae for energy, for food, and in pharmaceutical. And if you want to know why we are doing this, because I want students to learn what comes from environment. Believe it or not, some of our students your students even may believe that egg comes from supermarket. Egg doesn't come from supermarket. Egg comes from farm. Egg needs a chicken to have an egg. So we want to teach them the basics. What is it being used? How it is going to, um, how is it going to affect their life? So doing that, we create a research guide. In research guide, we have articles, books, videos, other resources. So we are providing open sources for our students to write a term paper. And within those, we also introduce them to the books. Next slide, please. So these are two books that Ted and I identified that was related to my course. So keep in mind, we are providing them resources to do a research paper but they have to do research. They have to know what research is and how to conduct research. Next slide, please. Where do they find it? In any course, you start with the syllabus, right? You start telling them what is it that they are going to do. And the first item I teach or share with my students is time management. Let me tell you that I also wear few other hats in my college. I am a, a coordinator of instructional technology. I act as a, a instructional technologist. I also add as advisor to our faculty to design their courses. So I have few hats to wear. That's why when I am talking about syllabus, I am not just talking to my students, I am also talking to my guy, uh, the colleagues. We talk about time management. And all of you know, COVID brought us to computers and computers brought us to time management and defining our roles while we were in our houses. We had to define our roles as a teacher, professor, household manager, and father and mother. So we want to make sure that in our syllabus, we clearly state our expectation. What is a research paper? And make sure that we know certain milestones. And we want to make sure that they know why they are doing the research and how topics within their research are connected and how much of open resources they can use to bring together. So they are building a thematic knowledge. They start from the beginning and they move forward. At some point they need assessment. And I would like to tell you that I am a fan of formative assessments than summative assessment. Summative assessments are usually scary for students. They'll get a grade, they'll GPA change, they'll pass a course or not pass a course. Formative assessments is telling them where they are. 
what they should do to have a better results. And certainly OER is very important for my students and for my course. In my course, I have four or five different books and I, I allow them to have their PDF files and uh, tell them which pages to go and all those. So that's the syllabus. That's how I created the environment to let my students flourish. Next slide, please. We all know this, right? It's called taxonomy, some kind of a taxonomy, Bloom taxonomy. We, I don't start at the bottom. I don't start teaching my students how to remember. I tell them if they understand, they will remember. And I try to give them examples. For example, if I am teaching about proteins, which is part of environmental science, I don't come to them with a large words like denaturization or denaturation. What is denaturation? It scares the kids or students in the, in the class. I ask them, do you make a scrambled egg? And how many people you think they know they make a scrambled egg or not? Many, all of them, they know about a scrambled egg. And I say, when the egg changes to a scrambled egg, proteins are denatured. Do you think they will not, they will forget that? They will never forget that. Each time they see a scrambled egg on Sunday morning or any morning that they are eating a scrambled egg, they'll remember, oh my God, the protein has denatured. And then I go to into understanding and trying to let them apply. If egg cooks and denatures, now, what, what else can happen to denature another protein? They say, how about barbecuing chicken? Great, good, we now learning. So we go step on, by step on this. And because we are using open resources, people can go and find out this chart or similar charts, find out the different meanings of it. So we are trying to build our students to get to analysis and evaluation part. They may not get to creating part. Next slide, please. I talked about this. I told you that I am not going to have a lot of summative ass assessments, but I am in a college, so I have to also provide grades. So I do some summative assessment. I emphasize heavily on formative assessments. Formative assessments can be a short conversation at the end of the class, whether it is a, a, a you know, online class, hybrid class, whatever conversation it is, bring a question to it, the students to answer. And uh, we can go forward from there. So my assessments are not major part of my course. Learning, practicing, exchanging ideas is is the main part of my course. Next slide, please. If they are going to do research, I want them to identify the question that they want to answer. Gather some resources, come back to me and say, Jalal, I have these resources. We can throw some of them out of the window, some of them out of the door, some of them under the table, get some that we are going to use, and that would be the second gathering. Or we can go back and find out what's going on. And we'll try to answer those three questions that you see on this slide. I won't be reading my slides, you can read my slides, but I want you to know that every student has the opportunity to see this. This slide was not created by me. This comes from Ted's work, from, from our library. Our library has a package, tutorial package for how students can, can learn about research. Next slide, please. Um, and thank you, Jalal. You have uh, just a minute or two to wrap up, please. I will do that. So our environment is city of Boston. And here is the questions that I asked them to answer. Who is your neighbor? Where is RCC? What's the difference between what you see in your neighborhood and when you come to the college? Next slide, please. I also emphasize on the availability of green space for mental health, walking, for emotional and uh, physical health. And that is in our neighborhoods. I would like everybody to take a second and look at it. Center of this 
slide, center of the city of Boston, are three neighborhoods, Roxbury, North Dorchester, and South Dorchester. And those neighborhoods are, major, majority of them are uh, um, African-Americans, low-income neighborhoods. They don't have any green space to walk in. When you come to Roslindale, JP, and West Roxbury, which is the higher percentage of Caucasians and other races, then you will find out that there's more green spaces. So there is some environmental injustice that we talk about in our class. And the last slide, I would like to bring to you that our, our city is built from different countries. Read about the countries that you see on this slide. We are not all Americans. We are from Haitian, we are from China, we are from different places. So we have to be aware of that fact. So what is the difference? We have to see that. And last one, last this time. So the message from my presentation is collaborate, design to empower, make sure that research is fun, teach them about scrambling, that's okay. And find the students as your teammates. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Jalal and Ted, for, for sharing that inspiring work at Roxbury College and, and making it real for students and their, their lived lives, their lived experiences. All right. And next, we're going to switch to um, the Equity and Open Education Project um, out of Oregon State. Oh, OSU is a different college. No, we're from Portland Community College, but yes, the state of Oregon, certainly. Thank you, Una, for that introduction. Do you have the slide, Liz, with our titles? Are we using that? No? I think we'll go directly to yours just to, for time. Okay, reasons. no problem. I will share my screen. So my name is Jen Claudini. I'm happy to be here with all of you. I'm a librarian from Portland Community College, and uh, I'm gonna give the very quick setup about the equity and open education faculty cohort uh, that we first designed at uh, Portland Community College, and now we're offering, as Una said, at the state level in Oregon. And then my colleague, Michelle Huss, who is a biology instructor is going to tell you a little bit about how she redesigned her, her course after participating in our cohort. So I'm giving it the setup and then Michelle will give you the implementation. Um, I always like to start out talking about the equity and open education cohort with this student, this, uh, this photo of our students from PCC. Um, we are a large four campus uh, college, the most urban college, um, the most diverse and urban college in Oregon, uh, and also the largest. Um, we had ha we have an OER steering committee and have had one for years. And um, in 2018, we were thinking about our our open education initiative at the college. We'd had a lot of good success with the the message that many of you, I'm sure, have also advocated for at your own colleges around cost and how cost can the cost of course materials can be a big uh, burden and, and barrier for our students. That message resonated with many of our instructors and it wasn't hard to help them understand that cost that we should consider the cost of our course materials and consider open materials for the cost savings. But we thought that there we were we were missing something right we wanted to help folks take the next step by considering that um, flexible copyright and open education practices can do so much more than just save students money, that it can also allow us to transform our classes so that our students, our actual students as pictured here are at the center of our courses and our course material design, that their voices and experiences are represented there. So we were able to pitch for internal um, funding at PCC and we designed this professional development experience for our instructors. But since then, since 2018, 
uh, I was able to collaborate with our statewide OER coordinator, Amy Hoffer from Open Oregon Educational Resources, and we were able to secure grant funding from William and Flora Hewlett Foundation. So for the past year, we've been able to offer this professional development experience at the state level. And my colleague, Michelle, who will speak with you next, participated in one of our state cohorts. So the quick and dirty description of the, the, the professional development design um, we have, we designed it to be a, a two part experience. The first part, we have um, our instructors who are participating do some learning during four weeks where we cover these four topics. We do kind of a primer on OER and copyright basics in week one, culturally responsive teaching in week two, universal design in week three, and open pedagogy in week four. Um, and then in part two, we, we say it's optional, you know, you, you're required to participate in part one, and then instructors have the option to um, implement a redesign of a unit of their class. Another core component of the professional development design is that we provide stipends for participation. We really believe that that uh, allows um, folks to participate across our diverse experience of instructors who are part-time, who are limited in their time, who don't have professional development funding. Um, so that has allowed, in my opinion, a broad swath of our colleagues to be able to uh, participate in, in the cohort. Um, another key component about the design of this professional development experience, because we're kind of a large and dispersed campus, we designed the, the cohort to be a virtual experience from the beginning, which came in really useful later through the pandemic and as we tried to scale up, as we were able to scale up for the state level. Um, it's we usually we, at PCC, we had cohorts, total cohort numbers of about 30 participants. At the state level, it's about 60 participants. But we break that big cohort up into small groups of about three or four folks. Um, and you work with your same small group through the first those four weeks. Uh, and uh, each week, we provide a, a prompt. And uh, the small groups get together for about an hour long conversation. So talking with colleagues, other teachers, to um, construct knowledge around these topics and share experiences and respond to scenarios. Um, so that is that we've, from the feedback we've heard, that's a, a really key feature of the learning and connection that happens in this equity and open education faculty cohort. Okay, and then the last thing I wanted to tell you is that the Canvas shell for the professional development uh, course is openly licensed and available. Um, you are more than welcome, invited to take it, make it your own, implement it in your own systems. I am happy to um, answer any questions or uh, you know, provide any guidance if I can. I know that we have some interest in other from other states. There's some folks from Colorado who are thinking about deploying it on a state level. So we're hoping that uh, folks will find it useful. Now I will hand it over to my colleague, Michelle. Thanks, Jen. I'm gonna, if you unshare, I will share. Uh, I am so, I'm so fortunate that I get to work with Jen and let me share this. I was so, um, I'm just, uh, open pedagogy changed my life, <laughs> my teaching life and my life. And so everybody saw the breadth of topics that we covered in the equity and open educational faculty cohort. It was amazing. My, um, I had been using OER texts already, but, but I didn't really involve my students in their own educational process until this cohort. And um, I'm gonna talk about genetics today, but uh, this, this really works for any class. So I have been thinking about open and uh, I've been thinking about equity and inclusion for many years, but I still had a traditional looking classroom in many ways. One of the, one of the first pieces is the disposable assignment. So a student turns in their homework, I interact with it, and then that's the end of its life. Uh, also, 
all of the questions, the research, the requests, the ideas, they came from me or the textbook, not my students. So they had little control, they had little voice in their educational process. Um, it was relevant to me. <laughs> I don't know if it was relevant to them. And we also relied heavily on texts so that um, really don't represent our students. So I said to myself, what are we gonna do? The first thing I wanna do is create an environment that's inclusive. And usually I do this, but I have never done it this early. So the very first thing that we do together um, is our intro discussion. If you're online, if you're together, you're, you'll do it in some way. What is my career, What are my career goals? What's my favorite ice cream flavor, whatever. Um, and I had to throw, throw in the image of the Pride Month because it is Pride Month. Um, but anyway, we went beyond this. And so we watched a TED Talk and read an article about the non-binary nature of sex and gender. And they heard terms like intersex, non-cisgender, trans, they, them, theirs. Double X chromosomes does not equate to male or female. And the binary depiction of male and female anatomy is false. So we were really going up against what the traditional curriculum says. And we did it together on an interactive Google Doc. We questioned it. You can see the questions that we asked and, and um, addressed together. And I learned from them as well because they taught me new terms and um, their experiential knowledge was much larger than mine. And it was so amazing. So we started off the term with some culture, with some equity. What does it mean to be inclusive? Um, so exciting. So then the next piece was, okay, how do I go from disposable to a legacy, something that lives on, a document that lives on beyond the term? And then to open where the student has a choice about the topics they research and they add to the curriculum of the course in which everyone interacts with, not just me, the instructor. So we'll talk about these three pieces. Um, one caveat that I'm learning about, and I have been teaching many years, but I, you know, right, we're all learning. The more clear I am, the better my rubrics are, the more I have parameters about length expectations, about examples, about how many questions about should we be thinking about, a clear purpose, what are my objectives, the better, the less frustration there is, right? Frustration's real for students. And so that's just a little caveat as we go on that that is so essential. Okay, so case studies and projects. So case studies, the students generated these case studies on their own. They worked as a pair. I did provide uh, a, a large topic list that they could work from. They could also go beyond it. Then uh, they were peer reviewed by other students. We, uh, we will then use these in the future. So they picked something that was relevant for them. We'll use these in the future and future terms for the first case study of the term. Uh, students will get to choose what's most relevant to them and then they'll generate their own. So you can see we're going to be stockpiling these and maybe um, the next step would be putting these into the public domain, uh, maybe making a book, I don't know, but you know the sky's the limit. So projects are really similar. Explain a tiny bit of the text your way with slang, with um, poetry, sketching, skits, YouTube, art, and we can use this in future terms in unison or in lieu of the text. And again, the sky's the limit. This, they live on. It's possible that we can make them into uh, the public domain. I'm kind of working on that and maybe a book, who knows? So these are just some of the things that we were working on. Um, this is an example of one, just one of the case studies a student was wanted to learn about um, systemic racism in genetics and looking at DNA, DNA databases. So it's really current and this meant a lot to her. her. She stepped, like most of the students, she stepped way above the expectations. Why? Because she was interested, it was relevant to her. And also because that responsibility for the legacy assignment, students really take it seriously. My name is on this. I'm gonna open licenses, this is gonna live on. So next, I'm just throwing it all out there. Homework, collaborative homework. So um, you can see this is just an example. Please don't read it all. But on the right, the black is the question that I wrote. And then you can see the different colors. So there's a red, a blue, and a yellow. Those are different students interacting with each other. And they're using analogies. They're collaborating. They're explaining. We're on Google Docs here. Um, it lives throughout the term. 
And the students explain it better than I do, by the way. Amazing. They're using all kinds of um, like movie analogies. So amazing. So the other piece is that that homework would model the assessment questions. And so probably the most significant piece of this transformation for me is uh, assessment as open pedagogy. And so um, students can write assessment questions that require critical thinking. They can reach, we saw Jalal's Bloom's taxonomy. They can reach higher on the Bloom's taxonomy towards integration and analyzing. They, we can move away from them not having a voice and using multiple choice and publisher text language. We can, um, they are, they become educators. And so I'm so excited about this. They use the homework. I created a couple videos just kind of like about clarity because that's a really big thing, right? Like be clear, how many points, how long is it? And then I gave them um, kind of a grab bag of different like compare and contrast. Here's a list of terms you can use. Uh, make, you know, try to write some process based questions, scenario questions. And each student gave us two questions per week on a collaborative document. And that's what I grabbed the test questions from. And oh my goodness, think about this is an example. So you just can look through, you can see some of the um, questions. Um, think about how that translates beyond the classroom to allow students to think about how do I invoke others to critically think? That's gonna translate beyond any classroom. So I just, I love this. And one more significant thing about this is I had to step out of the way. I had to see my own bias that teachers know everything. Yeah, I like I had, to, it, there it is, right? Right smack, right in the face. I got to step out of the way and let them shine. And when I did, look at the questions they write. They're, they're questions that you and I would write. They're amazing and beyond. So, um, so, so wonderful to have um, open, open test question generation. So what does this all mean? I'm certainly not an expert. <laughs> I loved the cohort that um, I loved. I loved participating in that. And um, students amaze me. They will take responsibility for their work. They want to open license. They're very excited. They want to get out in the public domain. They want legacy assignments. They want to know that they're going to be attributed. They teach me. If I can get out of the way, they teach me. They teach each other. So I think we need to move aside more. At least I do. I'll speak for myself. I'm looking at my time. I think I'm close. But I, I also included just a few things. Um, just showing that they can open license it. They want to open license it. Um, Michelle, you have you have about thirty seconds. <laughs> I'm, I'm I'm done. I I'm just um, they're they're so into it. They're so excited about it, and so am I. Thank you so much. Um, I know all of these projects are so exciting and we could spend 30 or 45 minutes on all of them. I just want to make sure we have enough time for our final project as well, which is um, the Open for Anti-Racism project with Joy Shoemate and um, Deborah Crumpton. Thank you all. Oh, sorry. One second here. Okay, so thank you all so much. Um, as uh, uh, Jen just did, I'm going to uh, kind of lead off here and take a, just a few moments to describe what the Open for Anti-Racism program is and then pass it on to one of our program participants, Dr. Deborah Crumpton. So my name is Joy Shoemate. I'm a with uh, I'm a director of online education at College of the Canyons in California, and uh, I had the pleasure of helping um, to co-develop and co-facilitate the course that our participants went through um, for the Open for Anti-Racism program uh, that was also generously funded by the Hewlett Foundation. So, you know, to get started, oh, here, um, we also, to, for some context, we, we call the, the program Open for Anti-Racism, OFAR for short. So to start off, kind of why, why did we develop this course? Why did we even build the program? Um, I think, you know, last year, especially after uh, the murders of George Floyd, um, Breonna Taylor and others, we started to see a whole lot of statements of solidarity. Um, we read a lot of 
commitments to change, either that our own institutions put out or businesses were putting out their, their statements and their, their commitments to change. Um, we saw a lot of pledges to be inclusive, but I think a way in which a lot of us struggled, this is a headline that I uh, cut from an Inside Higher Ed article, was how, like now what, you know, how do we enact the change that we're committing and pledging ourselves to do and to be? Um, so, you know, really for me, the question wasn't why OFAR, but why not? And uh, let's get to it. Um, you know, I'll say as, as, a, as a woman of color, but I think more importantly, just as a human being, uh, experiencing those senseless murders, um, I was happy and proud to see that our consciousness was changing uh, individually and as a society. But a lot of those statements felt a little bit empty because we, we weren't really sure what next steps to take. Um, so while those experiences were, were painful, um, I was excited because as an educator, I think it provides each of us the opportunity to um, actually move forward and, and do something, take it a step further than um, lovely statements, but move into action. And that was really the goal of our Open for Anti-Racism program. So, we got to work. And uh, what that looked like was um, developing a course that participants went through um, to explore how to use OER and open pedagogy to make their courses more anti-racist. Um, this program was open to uh, community college instructors in the California Community College system. We had over 300 applicants and 17 spots available. So there was a great demand, um, but you know, we were able to facilitate a, a small cohort of faculty through this program. Uh, it's important to note too, that our participants in the program really represented um, a, a diverse set of, of colleges within our state. So um, you know, ranging from their demographics to location, you know, locale. So we had some rural colleges, city colleges, um, and their disciplines of, of, um, of instruction also ranged. We had uh, faculty from EMT. You're gonna hear Dr. Deborah Crumpton, who's a business instructor, uh, early childhood education, um, ESL. So there, there were a range of, of faculty who uh, willingly participated in, in this program. So as I shared, we started off with a four week course. Um, I co-developed and co-facilitated the course with Dr. Kim Gruey from Northern Virginia Community College. She was a fabulous colleague to work with. And what we did was broke down that four week uh, course into basically four modules. So first is um, exploring you know, what is anti-racism, uh, then what is OER, and how do we use that to support anti-racism? Then we moved on to what is open pedagogy? And then in the end, our participants created an action plan. An important part of this entire project was not only the learning that was happening and collaboration that was happening within the course, but we wanted our participants to be able to implement something immediately. And so those action plans went into effect in the the spring semester. Uh, so they began immediately by taking what they'd learned, developing a plan, and then immediately implementing it. And that was um, something I'm really proud of because it was a way that we were able to take action and, and move towards uh, actively making our courses anti-racist. So I know we're short on time, so I will move through quickly. Um, but in terms of just defining anti-racist pedagogy, um, this was really important because our participants and uh, as was stated before, Kim and I, we were all learning together. So it was important um, that we set the, the stage and kind of explored what anti-racism even means and what anti-racist pedagogy means. Uh, I, I won't read all of these things to you, but it was really important that we uh, framed what it means to bring race into the conversation. Um, and to think about the opportunities that OER and open pedagogy allows for us to dismantle a lot of the, the, structural, um, the structural racist systems that have built education, that have built the disciplines in which um, you know, each of them are, are experts. 
So uh, yeah, another important part of this course was, you know, again, bridging that gap. Um, so really trying to find a way to, uh, and it was actually, as we were doing, you know, exploring more and working with the participants, it was quite clear how um, open pedagogy and OER could be leveraged uh, to build anti-racist courses. Um, so it, some of these things were mentioned already in the, in the previous presentations, but considering who, whose voice um, are, is your textbook written by white males, most likely, but OER provides an opportunity for you to um, validate and include uh, voices from uh, participants in the field, experts in the field, whose voices may not otherwise have been um, included in the text. Um, also, you know, again, there was talk about disposable versus non-disposable um, assignments. You know, we were looking at textbook replace, replacement, but also the opportunity to bring students into the process of, um, you know, sort of the low hanging fruit is maybe you're replacing images so that they're more reflective of students in your college, uh, but also students becoming participants in creating the content uh, was really, really important. So uh, it was exciting to watch our participants explore the ways in which they could bring their own students into the process of helping to create content. Um, and we did have, have some participants who had students uh, create test, uh, test questions as well. So that was really, really exciting. Um, and then uh, kind of the last component of the course was um, our participants developing an action plan, as I mentioned. So these are just the questions. We intentionally left them pretty broad, but they were just uh, to guide our participants to think about what it is that they were going to implement in their own course. Uh, obviously, we, we were looking for plans that could be implemented immediately. So those might be some immediate uh, quick steps or shorter steps, but all of our participants also had these really big goals and plans um, that they wanted to implement as well. So uh, the last part of this program was just some ongoing support. So our, our participants went through this four week course uh, in January of this year. And then after that, they had this spring semester to be implementing their plans. And we just offered, the program offered uh, some ongoing support in the form of monthly workshops, um, speaker series, and, uh, and then we're actually rounding out the last of our showcases where faculty will share what they did this past semester. So that is it. I want to pass it on over to Deborah. Please do feel free to reach out if you have any questions. And uh, Deborah, you can take it away. All right, thank you. Um, Good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's let me just get my screen shared here, and uh, we'll get started. I uh, I am fully aware of the time, and so um, um, can you, everyone see my screen? Just to double check yes, that. Okay, yes, we can, Deborah, and please take as much time as you need. You have um, a wonderful course to show to everyone. Well, I want to be respectful. But thank you, and I appreciate that. You know, I, I, and I appreciate the excitement of Jalal and Michelle, you know, it's, you get excited and Jen, and we, we start talking about the work you're doing. There's never hardly enough time and you just want to share as much as you can. So I teach, um, I teach business classes and introduction to business is our bread and butter class at the Sacramento, at Sacramento City College where I teach. Um, it is a course that tends to attract not only um, first time students, but students who are really exploring options, you know, it has no prerequisite. And it's a relatively attractive class. Everybody wants to learn about business. Before I get into the nuts and bolts of, um, of what I did, I just like to uh, show this land acknowledgement because I always start my presentation with this to remind us who we are and on whose land we speak, right? It reminds us of our privilege. So as Joy talked about, we all had to put together after our four week face-to-face um, -face, well, virtual course, our action plan. What were we gonna do not only this spring, but long-term? And like most of my colleagues, I was very ambitious. I said, oh, certainly I can get all this accomplished in the spring, of course I can. You know, I can not only integrate and remix the text I'm using, I can create content that's anti-racist, I can create these learning experiences for students, and oh, by the way, no problem generating student um, <clears throat> content. Well, that was more ambitious uh, than I realized. But, you know, I did roll up my sleeves and get busy because like most disciplines, I am most interested in having students see themselves 
and see the path to success for themselves. And so looking at this discipline for what it is, a colonized white centered discipline where people of color tend to be other and their successes, our successes tend to be um, um, you know, something as, as the exception and not the rule. And I wanted students to also recognize the historical misrepresentations of people of color within this uh, discipline. And I realized that all of this had to start with me. And I have been on this, I've been on this journey because I think it is a journey to become anti-racist and to develop a consciousness of inclusiveness. So uh, the, de the decolonizing had to start with me. And prior to having the privilege of being in this program, I had already started doing a lot of work in that regard. So I had decolonized my tax, I had adopted an OER textbook, and I had started to develop assignments, um, not necessarily with student voice, but where students could see themselves. And as I said, it's a journey. So two of the assignments that I am, that I've had the most success with in my business introduction to business class has been these two. Uh, one is, um, tends to be a really fun assignment where students look for an entrepreneur who is most like them. And I'm always interested in the questions that I get when students read this assignment. So Professor Crump, you, you mean who looks like me? You mean like, you know, they ask for everything except race. And so I, you know, I give them that example. But the assignment that is most probing, probing that I want to share with you is this assignment that I call analysis of racial bias in marketing. I start the assignment with a rel relatively easy video. This is a two minute video that I I'm not going to show here, but uh, it will attempt to play about um, marketing from a retail perspective by this company that's in beauty industry. So students look at it, no big deal. But then they get to this engaging video by this young Latino who starts to talk about, who walks them through this supermarket and starts to talk about <clears throat> products like, um, you know, Aunt Jemima. And he says things like, whose mama is that anyway? And it's just very thought provoking kind of um, comments that this young man has for students. And <clears throat> so you see just hearing his voice, you, you can kind of imagine, right? How he's gonna take students through this journey. And it's only a five minute video. These are my instructions, and although this is a busy, a busy slide, I think these instructions are relatively important. So I just want to share a couple of things with you uh, from these instructions. One is, you know, <clears throat> engaging anyone in a conversation about race tends to be um, relatively uncomfortable for them. And I think it has to be more comfortable for us. I've gotten myself to the point where I'm really comfortable talking to anyone about race. And I believe that I can do it with compassion as well as honesty at the same time, holding both myself and them accountable. And so I know my students, however, are not necessarily there. So I want to remind them that as they share their experience of this video, that that's their truth. I want them to be tolerant of others, right? And I want them to recognize that everybody's truth is valid. And so I just start by simply asking them how they feel because making a heart connection before you make a head connection, I think is most important in everything we do. And so when they, after they look at these videos, I want them to try as Jalal has done, have a personal experience with this, right? What three products that you use, you know, look at services, can you identify the racism in them, in, the, in those products? Now, what I've discovered is I, the, I need more clearer instructions on this. I need to help them to see the racism in the products because they're not, they're, they don't have that lens. So although this worked well um, this spring, it wasn't as deep as I wanted students to go, it wasn't as probing as I wanted them to go. And so they had to then answer the question, have you ever been treated unfairly? And so, you know, students, this broad, rich perspective of, of students gives us a broad perspective of, of answers. And so students of color said, yeah, I felt ignored and unwanted. I mean, this is general comments, right? And another student who taught, looked at this generationally, remember this experience that he had with his father. My white students was really interesting. Um, particularly this last comment, I am not my ancestors. It reminded me of two things. One is that just like students of color often don't know our history, students, white students don't know their history and they don't understand that they have stepped into their privilege. They've been born into it. And so finding a way to help students to see that and to honor that is, uh, is my work as we continue to go forward. These are some more generalized comments. Um, I found the outlier comment worth sharing because it reminds me 
of how no matter what you do, you have to really push students to get into this conversation about racism, right? This student said, of all the assignments you gave, Professor Crumpton, this is the only one I would change. I didn't learn anything from it, right? And it reminds me, you know, of, um, of the work that's to be done to get students into race. So how am I sharing this? Well, I share everything I do with fact, I serve in many capacities on my campus and I share comments about, I see race in everything. And so every time someone says something, I, I, I bring that lens so, and ask them who's being disadvantaged by this, right? Who's being disadvantaged by this policy? So not only at department meetings do I do that, but I do it in every capacity. And then I'm sharing my OFAR, my Open for Racism um, experience at a professional development activity that I, we are doing on our college campus a week before classes start. Um, and so uh, what lessons have I learned from all of this? Well, to move anybody through anti-racism, to include me, I first have got to move through racism. And that's important, right? I mean, you cannot take people where you're not willing to go. You cannot ask someone to do the learning that you aren't willing to do. And so racializing of self is, ne is necessary. And there's a, lot, there's a lot of time, energy, and effort required, right, in making our classes not only anti-racist, but open andragogy, right? It's, it just takes a lot of work and a lot of time. And so you got to take great care of yourself. I imagine that most of you are like me, and that is that you're too tired right now. Um, but, the, but my lessons are the lessons that I take with me everywhere about this work, right? That I can only lead my students, other faculty where I'm willing to go. I can only teach what I know. I can only give what I have. And so if you want to come to this work with compassion, you have got to develop it by one, understanding the history of people who are not like you. Thank you for your time. Well, whoa, <laughs> what an amazing finish. Thank you so much um, to Joy and Deborah and um, our other presenters as well, Michelle and um, Jen and uh, Jalal and Ted. And we just have a few uh, quick messages. Um, and I, I'm, we'll, we're monitoring the chat, but we haven't had it. We've had some wonderful comments. We haven't had too many questions. Um, Liz, do you want to take us out here on our final uh, slide or two? Sure. So. Um... As Una mentioned at the top of the webinar, this is our last of our spring webinars, but we do have some um, summer activities going on. We have an equity, diversity, and inclusion um, book club happening with, with the synchronous and asynchronous um, discussion. It's we're reading from um, Equity Talk to Equity Walk. I have my copy up there. That's why I was looking up there. Um, and we also have, since a lot of this was about open pedagogy, we have an open pedagogy adventure. Um, so we, we've we already had our, our kickoff meeting, but we have um, meetings uh, every two weeks. Um, the next one's on Tuesday, and you can find out more at OEG Connect, and I'll, I'll put that link in the chat in just a minute. Um, and, and so we'll be exploring different things. Some of the things that were talked about here, um, like uh, non-disposable or legacy, I guess is a good word. Um, assignments and we'll also be talking about interactivity like uh, H5P and um, other other topics like that. Um, just if you're not familiar with CCCOER um, on our website, which is CCCOER.org, we've got a tab with uh, upcoming open education conferences. We have an email list um, and um, we've got blog Post on equity, diversity, inclusion. We have student OER impact stories on our website. And I think that's it. Excellent. Thank you so much, Liz. And we are open for questions now. Um, so um, uh, please uh, feel free to unmic yourself. Um, I know we're at four minutes after the hour, but I think we can hang around for just a few more minutes. I don't want to keep um, our, our speakers uh, a lot beyond that, but. Um, please do um, speak up if you have a, a question or perhaps a comment. <laughs> Thank you, Jen. I know we are at the top of the hour. Well, thank you all for coming today. Um, I, I hope that uh, you enjoyed this as much as I did. Um, and um, we will, we look forward to seeing you over the summer. Um, and if not that, back in the fall for um, our webinars then. And Liz, I think you can stop the recorder.